Hello and welcome to the online service for Christchurch and St Barnabas for the 13th of September. My name's Stephen and this is my wife Dawn. Hello. Today is an important day in the life of the church in the parish because it marks the return to worship in a place of worship for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> um, so there is at 11 o'clock, there is a service of Holy Communion and there'll be uh, similar services each Sunday in the ensuing weeks at uh, Christchurch or St Barnabas. If you wish to be there at any of those services, then you need to let the church office know and hopefully there will be on screen uh, the contact details for that, to be able to do that. It's important for the church to know who wishes to go because there has to be control on the numbers. And don't forget that there will be a need, I think, to wear a face masks, for example, while you're in that service. It's really exciting, isn't it, that um, there's this step forward really that uh, the church can happen and uh, so uh, although it might be a service that's a, that's going to be different than what we're used to there will still be a, a said holy communion um, and people uh, will be able to gather together although they'll have to still sit um, socially distancing and of course wear face masks um, and um, and there won't be any uh, singing, sadly, but um, but hopefully the, I think there's still going to be a hymn or a song played so that people can kind of sing in their heads. Um, so it'll be a bit different, but at least it's uh, it feels like a, a step forward that the church is opening. So that's that's exciting. Yeah. One notice we need to give you uh, this Sunday is about the revision of the electoral roll. So you may remember that the process of revising that was started in February, but had to stop because of the lockdown. So if you are on the electoral roll and are happy to stay on the electoral roll, then you don't need to do anything. If you gave your name and details uh, back in February, then uh, the church will assume that you still wish to follow through on that and you need to take no further action. If you wish to be added or removed by, uh, by the church from that electoral roll, then you need to contact uh, Andy Thomas at the church office. Hopefully the contact details again are on the screen. And if you don't know whether you are on the electoral roll or not, feel you need to find out, then again, contact Andy Thomas. So this process needs to be completed by the 21st of September so please do contact him by that date. I don't know if any of you have um, walked past church over the last um, couple of weeks on a, a Wednesday and a Thursday you'll see two event shelters out um, and it's uh, this is something that we started uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, called the shelter and um, the idea was that it was to uh, be a, a presence in our community um, uh, particularly for um, young families, we, um, uh, we're we very aware that Happy Tots couldn't meet uh, during this time and I'm not sure when we are going to be able to meet again, it, it, probably not until next year. Um, and we knew that there were quite a lot of uh, young uh, parents and grandparents that are, are really missing contact uh, with other people. And so... Uh, this idea came about and um, and and when we set up uh, the first shelter on the the first Wednesday which was the day that school started back um, it was such a beautiful sunny day the sky was blue and um, and we uh, we looked up and we saw a beautiful rainbow in the sky it was a smiley rainbow rather than one that way I think that way is caused by the raindrops and this way is caused by ice particles in the in the atmosphere uh, and the sun shining on those but whatever it was just such a lovely a lovely thing to see and it felt like a sign from God really um, just a reminding of us, his, uh, us of his promise to us and uh, and uh, yeah it was a real encouragement for all of us and and this shelter it's uh, it's been 
it's been a lovely thing that we've been able to do. People have walked past and have come in for a cup of coffee. It's the idea is it's a pop in, so you can't stay for any length of time. Um, but it's a people have stopped in and and had a chat and just talked about uh, their experience of of um, being in lockdown or their concerns about their children at school or. It's just been an opportunity that we've been able to chat with people and, and offer to pray with them. Um, so, yes, it's been a privilege to be part of that. And so I just wanted to share that with you. As we talk now um, and as we're filming this, uh, we know that there's some uh, restrictions that have come into place. And on Monday, things will be different and uh which may mean that we can't do the shelter for a little while longer, which is a shame. But. Um, these things happen and, and we have to be ready and prepared for that. But it, it was good that in the, these last two weeks, we've been able to do that. And, and that's been a, a positive thing that our church has been able to do in the community. Yeah. So although it may have to stop, um, that's a church to think about. But it, we do mm. hope that that is something which could be resumed again in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Today is uh, Creation Sunday and Mike has put together a video about God's creation and what we can do to preserve and protect it, how to look after our environment. As part of Creation Sunday, um, we wanted to share with you a few of the things that members of our church family have been doing to take care of creation, to um, to do their bit. So here is a list from Facebook that um, um, Penny put together. So we've got more cycling, more cycling rather than driving for those shorter distances, having glass milk bottles delivered um, rather than buying um, plastic from the supermarket, laundry with eco eggs to, um, to reduce the need for detergents. Uh, we've got wormeries and composting. Um, clothes, uh, cloths for cleaning rather than disposable, also biodegradable baby wipes, um, reusable litter for pets, filling up f cleaning fluids and buying eco-friendly items um, at, art shop, at the art shop on Chilwell Road. Um, we've got um, buying a water butt for the garden so you're not using water from the hose pipe from the mains um, and other water saving devices from Seven Trent cutting down on meat or cutting it out entirely, um, looking for and using recyclable packaging in shops, um, changing your energy supply. This is one that I've done and saved quite a lot of money. So money supermarket there um, and replacing replacing gas appliances with electric or induction, um, using block soap rather than liquid and um, wrapping gifts in secondhand fabrics rather than wrapping paper. There's also someone who's been using sustainable clothing from um, from found online. So there's lots and lots of things that we can be doing, small things, uh, lifestyle changes that will all contribute to make a bigger difference in the war on climate change. And Tear Fund has put together a little um, a little video about their campaign called Reboot. And what it does is it thinks about this time of lockdown, how so much has changed so quickly in the last six months. And what if we got that momentum and we continued with, with it um, for things that really um, that also really matter? You know, we've gathered together to fight this pandemic um, really well. There's a real togetherness. What if we got together in the same way about our planet, about the war on climate change? So I'm going to play the video and then um, we're going to hear from um, Lucy and Helen Hobbs, who have been doing um, a bit more um, um, to, um, to combat the war on climate change. And it's really inspiring uh, what we're going to hear from them. COVID-19 has shone a light on how unequal our world really is. For many people around the world, lockdowns have meant cramped living conditions, loss of jobs, increasing debt and days without food. And it's reminded us of how we've damaged God's creation. Air pollution has made people more vulnerable and our destruction of nature has made it more likely for diseases to jump species. But as we've journeyed through this crisis, 
three big positive shifts in society have also started to happen. The first is a shift away from individualism. We live side by side, but separate from each other. Now we found greater togetherness. Even though we're physically distanced, we're coming together as communities. Local communities are supporting each other in WhatsApp groups and mutual aid, and we've seen how thousands of key workers bravely hold our society together. The second shift has been valuing life more than productivity. So often our value has been defined by what we have or how productive we are. But now dignity of life for everyone is top of the agenda. So much of the economy has been put on pause to protect people's health. People who are homeless have been housed and millions of us are giving our time and resources to support the most vulnerable. And lastly, there's a shift towards greater imagination. In a poll during April, only 9% of Britons wanted life to return to normal after lockdown. We're discovering how much is possible. We built new hospitals in days. We've seen unprecedented government support and a world change overnight. Now more than ever, people are hoping that the world really will change for the better. But this change is not guaranteed to last. If we don't act, we could easily fall back to the old normal. Or we could go in a worse direction, where the lockdowns result in racism and division, inequality gets worse and public money is used to bail out big polluting companies. But if we embrace these three big shifts towards togetherness, life and imagination, we could see real change. The reboot of the economy could fast track action on the climate emergency, protect the most vulnerable and reduce inequality. This just might be possible if we take action together. In his Easter sermon, Archbishop Justin Welby said, after so much suffering, so much heroism from key workers and the NHS, we cannot be content to go back to what was before as if all is normal. There needs to be a resurrection of our common life. As the people of God, we can be a part of casting a vision for a way forward. How will you play your part? Hi, I'm Helen. I'm here with my daughter Lucy. Hi. And um, over the past few years, we've made quite a few lifestyle changes to help climate change. But Lucy, tell us what you've been doing recently. Yes, well, a couple of months ago, we went on a cycle ride with Extension Rebellion around um, the city centre. And we decorated our helmets with flowers and plants. And we put banners on our bikes and we cycle to the city centre and cycle around it twice to raise awareness about climate change. Mm -hmm. And why did you want to be part of Extinction Rebellion? Well, because like lifestyle changes are good, but we also need some big changes from the government to really make a good effect. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing I like about Extinction Rebellion is that they protest in a peaceful way. Yeah. They use something called non-violent direct action which um, other movements like the suffragettes and civil rights movement used okay. and it's been shown to be actually really effective in yeah. getting governments to change. Uh, and also like there's lots of different faith groups part of Extinction Rebellion yeah. and there's Christian climate action. Yeah. And even Rowan Williams was marching and protesting a couple of weeks ago in London. Yeah. So has there been anything else that you've seen Extinction Rebellion do? Well, on Newsround I've seen like people in Wales lie on the floor with sheets of red around them as if to say they'd be dead because in 2050, if we don't do anything, Cardiff will be underwater. So yeah, it's, we need to act. Yeah, it's pretty it. frightening, isn't it? And I think yeah. that Extinction Rebellion are like modern day prophets. They've looked at the yeah. science, they've looked at things happening right now and they're saying actually if we don't change our ways then these things are going to happen yeah so we really do need to sit up and listen and yeah. try to make small changes in our lives and try and get the governments to make bigger changes as well yeah so um what else have you been doing you've written a letter to darren henry haven't you yeah tell us about that um well um earlier i wrote to darren henry about climate change and i asked him if he would support the CEE bill. Yeah, um, so that is the Climate and Ecological Emergencies Bill. Okay. Um, and that's asking, amongst other things, for the government to set up a citizens' assembly. So, and yeah. did you get a response? Uh, I haven't got one yet. Not yet. But, so I have yeah. a quote, though, from him, from the press. It's Darren Henry said, I do not, at this point, support declaring a state of emergency. So how does that make you feel? 
I don't really like that because climate change is an emergency and we have to do stuff about it if whales are underwater. We need to act. Yeah. So what do you think people could do to get involved? Um, things like getting informed about it by books and online is good. Yeah, you can find out more information about Extinction Rebellion online. Yeah. Um, and what about writing to your MP? Yeah, as well as to ask them to support um, the CEE bill. Yeah. And again, they've got a website and we watched a video, didn't we, which helped us understand more about it. Yeah. And it helps you write letters. That's brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah. OK. Thank you for sharing that, um, Lucy and Helen. That's really inspiring to hear uh, what you've um, what you've been doing. And um, one thing Lucy said was about getting informed. Um, as we um, we're called to be people of prayer to intercess for our world, um, it's great to get informed of the facts so that we can pray. And one way that we can do that is through a program that's on tonight. If you're watching this on Sunday, David Attenborough's program, Extinction: The Facts, um, which is on Sunday evening on BBC One at 8 p.m. Highly um, encourage watching that. Um, the programs that have been on before have been really informative and in some cases um, uh, provide those facts um, to move us, uh, to get inspired, um, to really care and do something for um, the world God has given us to take care of. So as this is Creation Sunday. Um, myself and the Eco Church team, a couple of us met together on Zoom, and we've got two challenges that we want to set for you this year. The first one um, is can you achieve a zero food waste week? And we'd like to hear stories um, um, and suggestions from you uh, for using up leftovers, um, even those little bits of um, cut off vegetables uh, from like broccoli or carrots that you wouldn't ordinarily eat. Um, what can you do to save putting them in the bin? And can you achieve a zero food waste week? Um, we'd love to hear how you get on. And the second challenge is um, to go the next level um, for, for a month. If you are having a meat-free Monday, go for a meat-free Monday and Tuesday. If you've decided to cut out beef, um, try going vegetarian for the whole month. Whatever your level is, go to the next level up. If you're already reusing um, some plastic containers um, see if you can reuse some other something else. Um, I don't know. Um, the ideas are are out there, and um, do a bit of research and see see what you can do. Um, if you've heard of anything on today's um, little video um, that um, you're not doing and you'd like to do, take it up. So we challenge you to those two things: uh, a zero food waste week and a whole month of going to the next level. was really interesting wasn't it I don't know about you but um, I felt a little bit challenged by some of the things they were saying um, our youngest son is down in South End on sea at drama school and he had to come back in March because of lockdown and he's actually become a vegan while he's been away and that was a bit of a challenge for us actually uh, finding some vegan meals um, to cook uh it was a bit of a first i don't think we've cooked vegan meals before no. we've got michael's a vegetarian but we haven't um cooked vegan before and uh and it uh it was it's good to be challenged we, you had a great cookbook didn't you that you got um which helped a, yeah a, helped a lot <laughs> so yeah i think to it was a challenge but it was one which we found achievable and i think dawn just saying that you know sometimes in mainstream cookbooks Vegetarian or even vegan might be a bit of a, a bit of a sideline, minor part. So I think getting the right cookbooks to, to use, finding things you like to cook, mm. uh, is, is key to actually achieving that. I think since he's left and he's gone back now, um, 
with the meats creeping in a bit but maybe maybe that was a bit of a challenge to us uh, watching that just to remind us to um to to look at uh finding meals uh, less meals with meat in them I think is a good thing and I, I don't know about you what, what you felt challenged uh, in or what you've done differently during mm. this time it's been an opportunity to do things a bit differently maybe because we've got more time to spend uh, in the kitchen or even in the garden um, yeah uh, so we've actually we've got a compost um, now because we've been spending more time in the garden and, and that's something we've been composting our food so we haven't got so much waste um food but yeah challenge us when you see us just see how we're doing on the on the meat front and um and and the, if there's anything that you have been doing that's different um why don't you just let the office know and we can um we can uh, let other people know about that and it might encourage others to to try doing something different just to to help our environment and and our reduce our food waste so coming up, we've got Chris doing the reading for today. Uh, we've got the sung worship and we've got Mike doing uh, the sermon. Uh, after the, this portion of the online service is finished, don't forget that there is a session for pub public prayers, um, <laughs> which uh, Esther is doing. So that may come up automatically or you may need to go online on uh, uh, to, to find it and click on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, before we move on then, let's, let's pray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us. And although worship and uh, fellowship can be that much harder uh, online, Lord, we pray that you would be with us day by day uh, in our walk with you. And we pray for our church leaders and for the political leaders as they come to decisions and plotting the way forward for the best for all of us. Mm. In your name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me pray as I begin. Father God, thank you that you have called us by name. Thank you that you know us. You know of what we're made. You know our potential. You know our limitations. Help us to listen to your voice. Help us to listen to your call. And I pray now that you would speak to us through this message by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. There were two fish swimming together in the sea. When along came a third fish, he said to the other two, don't you just love sw um, the water? They both took a blank look at each other and replied, what on earth is the water? We live in a sea of hurry. Hurry is so ingrained in us that we no longer see it. If anything, when someone or something does something to put on the handbrake to slow us down, it feels uncomfortable. The queue in the supermarket, being stopped at consecutive red lights, a slow driver in front, turning on the computer to find it's doing updates, being put on hold for 45 minutes to speak with customer services, intermittent Wi-Fi. When anything slows us down, it feels uncomfortable. But why should we be worried about hurry? In short, because hurry is incompatible with a life following in the way of Jesus. Central to a life following in the way of Jesus is love. The greatest command is to love. In Luke 10, 27, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind. 
and love your neighbour as yourself. Hurry and love don't go together because love takes time. When the Apostle Paul describes love in his first letter to the Corinthians, he begins with love is patient, love takes time, hurry does not. The enemy doesn't turn up with a pitchfork, red eyes glaring. He's far more intelligent than that. The word Satan means deceiver. Deception is just that. You think you're on to the next best thing, but it's poisoning you from the inside out. Deception is similar to, dis uh, to distraction. It's where we get the phrase, looks may be deceiving. When working in the kitchen, a chef played a trick on me where he took the perfectly compacted solid disc of coffee grounds from the barista machine, added a garnish of whipped cream and then brought it to me. Here, try this. I fell right into the trick, distracted by the tasty appearance and I choked on a mouthful of dry coffee grounds. When we're distracted, we don't look beyond what's on the surface. We don't ask the deeper questions. I wonder how many dumb decisions you've made whilst distracted. Impulse buys. Something you neither wanted or needed, but, uh, but the advertising or the nagging pressure or the, the in-the-moment need to buy something got the better of you. Distracted by the price tag. If it's that cheap, I'll get one just in case. When we shop on impulse, we don't actually afford the time to consider whether whatever it is, you know, food, clothing, technology, souvenirs, another colourful and plastic toy, we don't take the time to consider whether it's been made ethically. Has what I just bought come from impoverished working conditions? Am I too hurried to consider whether I've just contributed to modern day slavery? Bad decisions can be made in our relationships whilst we're distracted. Longing for a relationship when you're single or craving something a little different without the effort if you're already married. When distracted, our mind wanders from the call on our lives as to live as children of God towards the acceptable pattern of the world, where flings and a succession of lovers is the Netflix normal. Too hurried to wait to be married before moving in together, just in case you might miss out. The world says enjoy the moment. Too hurried to invest in your spouse to do romance at the end of a tiring and full-on week. Hurry distracts us from what is true. The word of God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Some of the dumbest things I've done have been when I've been distracted, but the very best things I've done have been when I'm in step with the Holy Spirit, mindful of what Jesus would do if he were me. Corrie ten Boom once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Now, before we go any further, there is a healthy kind of busyness where your life is full with things that matter. By definition, Jesus was busy too. The problem isn't when you have a lot to do, it's when you have too much to do and the only way to keep up is to hurry. The real irony of me beginning this series on the book The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer is that I've been super busy in the past two weeks. I'd actually planned to read John Mark Comer's book whilst away camping, but didn't get any reading done. And then this last week, I had just no wiggle room. I really feel like the last person on earth to be sharing on how to unhurry your life right now. The great news is this, that I'm not the teacher. Jesus is. I have just been given the privilege to convey the good news to you. There's going to be practical application in this series, which will challenge you to the core.
It did, to me, it challenged me as I read the book. More so as I realised just how incompatible a life of hurry is with following in the way of Jesus. For some time now, I've attempted to create more time. Perhaps you do the same. I'd thought the problem was inefficiency in something I'm doing. And of course the solution could be another app or way of organising or an itinerary for the day or a different process. Trying hard to find the next time-saving method that would help me out of my time short problems. But now I've come to think about it, and I'm sure you'll be the same as me, in that I'm more efficient than ever before. Yet still, I feel as though I have less time. There's apps, devices, planners, journals, you name it, ways of making yourself more efficient, even different ways of piling your laundry so that it fits into the drawer neatly so you can get what you want really quickly. It hasn't actually gained me that much more time, or the time I did create, I filled with something else. The other quandary for me, and many of you, is children. How can I achieve any sense of efficiency with children? They're time absorbing vacuums. Whatever your best plans, however well organised you may be, they can disrupt all of it without any warning. So time really isn't the problem. In fact, time is a God ordained limit which actually affects anybody under the sun. No one can get around the fact that there's only 24 hours in a day. Everything we say yes to is a thousand no's. What if limitations are not something to fight against, but something to gratefully accept from God as a signpost to the, to the call that he's placed on your life? We're not able to do all the things we want to do right now because that's not what God's called you to do right now. Rachel, my wife, has been wanting to launch a business selling her artwork online since before Maddie was born. She's had friends who've been able to do this with young children, but it didn't happen for her. She never found enough time to do it. Recently, she's been able to launch that business <laughs> during lockdown. She hasn't gained any more time. But I believe God has granted the go ahead for the business and Rachel has been selling her work online. The delay was frustrating because she saw other people doing something similar. Looking back, God's ministered to Rachel so that she has a clearer vision for how she can bless others with a particular line of prints and cards. Limitation meant she moved at the speed God intended and the result is a shared vision for the business. So time is a preset limit which God uses to signpost us towards his call. The solution to hurry isn't more time. If it were, I think God would just give us more of it, though it's likely he knows we'd just fill that time becoming more tired, more anxious and more hurried. We need a way of life. We need a way to live deliberately right in the middle of the chaos. Q. Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 11 um, verses 28 to 30, which we've heard read, says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Two things we need to know about this passage. Firstly, a yoke is a first century idiom for a rabbi's way of teaching the way of teaching the Torah. It's his teaching on how to be human, his teaching on how to shoulder the weight of life with marriage, divorce, prayer, money, sex, conflict, all of it. And secondly, to be with Jesus as his apprentice, as a follower, means to become like Jesus, to do what Jesus would do if he were you. The whole point is to model all of your life after Jesus and in doing so recover your soul. 
This is how you attain life, salvation and healing. In Matthew 11, it's an invitation for all the tired, the burnt out, the stressed and all those stuck in traffic and behind on their to-do lists, all those turning to Facebook as a distraction just to get through another day. Jesus invites us to step out of a hurry society to a life of soul rest. It's the classic, what would Jesus do, with the addition, if he were you. Okay, here's the problem. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm tired. You've loved the least, the lost, the marginalised. You've done it from a heart of loving Jesus for his death on the cross uh, for your sins. You've spent time with the Father in prayer, not, not as a burden, but because you love to be in his presence. Your life is a sacrifice of worship to him. You feel the power of the Holy Spirit running through you, but still you're tired. Perhaps you've had one of those bracelets um, that were popular when I was a teenager, WWJD. I even had a fake TY Beanie Baby uh, from when those were things with WWJD written on. What possible difference can this make? This is where the teaching gets invasive. You can't have the life of Jesus without adopting the lifestyle of Jesus. Joy, rest, resolute peace, an unanxious way of being, a relaxed manner. Do you want that? Jesus realises that the most restful gift he can give the tired is a new way of doing things, a new way of carrying life, a fresh way to bear responsibilities. He doesn't offer escape, he offers equipment, resources. Jesus means that obedience to his teaching will develop in us a balance and a way of carrying life that will give more rest than we have ever been able to live before, than any way we have been living. We cannot escape the fall. Life is going to be hard, but the best way to mitigate the pain as we advance Jesus' return is to follow his way. At his side, like two oxen in a field tied shoulder to shoulder, with Jesus doing the heavy lifting, at his pace, slow, unhurried, present to the moment, full of love, joy and peace. An easy life isn't an option, an easy yoke is. We're likely to have read these passages of scripture before, and we most likely agree wholeheartedly that Jesus is speaking the truth. But I haven't allowed that truth to invade and overtake habits which cause me to hurry. Habits which distract me from God's presence in my life. Invade is a word I believe the Holy Spirit has given me as I prepared for today. Because this series will feel invasive. Through the next four weeks, we're going to be teaching some practices which are necessary for life under the yoke of Jesus, necessary for adopting the Jesus lifestyle. These are silence and solitude, Sabbath, simplicity and slowing. Take a deep breath. It's okay. It is biblically sound. You see, Jesus in John 15 describes himself as the vine. We are the branches. Every branch that remains attached to the vine will bear fruit. Now, if you've ever visited a vineyard, then you have seen that the branches are supported by a trellis, a straight piece of wood which supports the branches. Without the support of the, bra support of the trellis, the branches won't bear fruit. Do you see that word picture? I mean, I thank God now for the opportunity to use my summer holiday camping fail as a relevant analogy for today. The poles to a tent are essential, they're an essential part of the tent, yet when the tent is up and you're sleeping inside you don't give much thought to them. The poles are a means to an end, but without them you'll never get the tent up in the first place. Poles, trellis, rules provide us with a structure to live within so that we can bear fruit. 
without a rule of life, some kind of support and structure to facilitate health and growth, your life with Jesus will wither. For many, the great danger of hurry isn't that we'll renounce our faith, it's that we'll become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we'll settle for a mediocre version of it. As it happens, without planning it at all, most of us will have an unwritten rule of life already, also known as habits. When your phone goes ping, you reach into your pocket uh, to see what the notification is without any thought. Each morning after the alarm goes off, going down to the kitchen to make a cup of tea, almost like you're on autopilot. These are habits. A rule of life helps to transform our habits by practices based on something better which promises to give a greater freedom. The big question is this. Will you allow Jesus to be your lifestyle coach? This series may upset, it may certainly challenge, but over the next four weeks we'll be taking a closer look at four practices which make up a rule of life based on Jesus's yoke, his teaching, one that is light and easy, with the hope that these practices will help us all to be less hurried and more present to the work of God in our lives, our homes, our church and our community. Let's pray together. I invite you to sit or stand, uh, but to open your hands ready to receive um, as we invite God's Holy Spirit to minister to us wherever we are, wherever you're watching from. So we pray, come Holy Spirit, be the prayer ministry team today, wherever, wherever we're watching from. And if you've tuned in today from a position of hurry, if, um, if there's been distractions uh, left, right and centre, Pray that the Holy Spirit would bring you, bring you peace, would refresh your soul, and give you, give you the space to really consider the life of Jesus, the one who says, "Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest." And we pray, Lord, yes, please. We want that rest. Please take, please take me and give me your yoke so that I may learn from you. I thank you that you are gentle and humble. I thank you for the rest that you offer for my soul. And if you want that, if you want a burden free, a burden free life, a life of freedom, join to Christ. And I pray that may the Holy Spirit strengthen you in your journey with him, strengthen you in your walk with him, give you the courage to step back from the world of hurry and to get in step with Jesus by his Holy Spirit. And Father God, I pray that over the next four weeks, <clears throat> you would continue to teach us all about your rule of life the practices that we can do to support and strengthen our walk with you. And if any of this is upsetting or challenging, I pray that you would 
share that you would talk that in home groups in friendship groups uh, with anyone you know uh, from our church that you would get in touch and you would ask for prayer because you're not alone we're the body of Christ we're the church and we can unhurry together so ask all this in Jesus name Amen
So as we draw our service to a close, may you experience the presence of God wherever you go. May you carry the peace of Christ to all you encounter. And may you grow in the knowledge and power supplied by the Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>